Well, these are three of the major soils of Minnesota. You're looking at what you would see if you were to dig a pit and then carefully remove your shovel marks so you could see the structure, the uh, grains of soil, the degree of aggregation that is typical of these soils. So first we have the Lester soil, which is Minnesota state soil. Uh, it was designated by the Minnesota legislature in 1987. And in part, it reflects uh, the transition soil. Uh, this is a soil that is basically from a prairie site, but very close to the transition between uh, the southern hardwood forests of southeastern Minnesota and the, in the tall grass prairie. Uh, so it makes it unique in that regard. It's well-drained soil, very fertile, very productive, and of course that's what we think of the soils of Minnesota. Uh, the Webster uh, is such an important soil in history. It's uh, basically a soil that dominates the northern part of Iowa and southern part of Minnesota, uh, characterized by being poorly drained. The uh, Lester is well drained. This tends to be naturally poorly drained. This typically requires artificial drainage in order to uh, take advantage of its high fertility. You can see the dark color uh, that is associated with high organic fraction uh, in uh, these soils. Uh, so very, very productive soils in the southern part of Minnesota. The uh, third soil here is the Fargo soil. This is a soil from the Red River Valley, and as the name implies, typical of what you would see in Fargo, North Dakota. Uh, remember that the valley goes uh, on both sides of the Red River, and uh, this is a soil that was deposited uh, while the valley was still covered by uh, geological Lake Agassiz, and this soil is very deep. You can see a very dark top horizon, very high organic matter. The soils are clay, uh, as is typical of many uh, lake uh, bottom soils. And it's very deep. Uh, there are pits from which this comes from uh, where these soils continue on down for 10 feet. And in a good year, uh, sugar beets will root that deep. We need to point out that the U.S. is one of nature's great wonder areas. The U.S. has 25% of the world's class one land. So we're really very blessed. But as you look at the map here, you do see uh, sort of four distinct colors regions in the map which represent the soils that we have. These orange soils that you see represent the Eustisol uh, soils, which are the oldest soils in terms of geological weathering. Think of the high temperatures, the high rainfall. So these are poor soils. Uh, the nutrients have been leached out over the years. They require fertilizers. The greens in here represent areas that are high organic matter soils. Uh, most of these are poorly drained. So as you think of Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, uh, Ohio, very productive soils, but they require drainage, but a, an important part of the Eastern Corn Belt. Then the greens that you see here, the dark greens, represent the mollusols. These are the areas that actually evolved under grasses, uh, whereas back in here, in fact, all of this eastern part of the United States, uh, those soils evolved primarily under forest, uh, as opposed to the grasses. And so the grasses dis uh, resulted in a very distinctive soil profile, uh, organic matter distribution uh, that was distinct from uh, either of the other two areas. And then the western part of the United States is really a uh, very heterogeneous, and most of this is because 
of the elevation, the degrees of erosion that have taken place over the years. Uh, and you can see all of these different colors representing uh, soils from very deep accumulated soils uh, in lowland areas uh, to the areas where uh, almost no soil because you're on uh, in the Rocky Mountains on rock with little or no vegetation. As you look at this map, the other part that uh, is not so evident is that there's also an associated cropping zones or regions with these soils. So as we look at this southeast and southern part of the United States, this was the old cotton uh, producing areas. This was uh, the first settled areas in the uh, New World. And uh, so cotton was dominant. Uh, peanuts uh, are important in this part of the US. A lot of these soils tend to be very sandy in many of these areas. Uh, the Midwest here, the Eastern Corn Belt as we think of it, would be uh, our primary corn soybean area. Uh, but there's a distinction between Eastern Corn Belt and Western Corn Belt, because as you get further west into the Corn Belt, uh, you get into uh, drier areas. Southeastern United States typically has 45 inches of rainfall or more. We would refer to it as uh, being in the humid area, uh, whereas the Midwest, out to the edge of Nebraska, uh, western Minnesota, we're in the uh, subhumid area where we typically get from 20 to 30 inches of rainfall as opposed to 30 to 45 inches as we move further east. Uh, so corn belt region, cotton region, and then the wheat belt. This is the big wheat growing area from Texas on up into Canada. Uh, in the southern plains, it would be uh, winter wheat. In the northern plains, it would be the spring wheat. To the western part of it would be the Durham wheats. And then in the inner mountain area, you have a mixture. But as you get out here into Idaho, Oregon, Washington, California, arid region but irrigated. So with irrigation, you can grow virtually any of the crops, and that's why uh, all of the fruits and vegetables out of California, uh, the apples out of uh, Washington, uh, the uh, berries out of Cal uh, uh, Oregon, and then uh, edible dry beans up in Idaho, and then, of course, through the Intermountain area uh, would be the range and pasture area, and the drier areas of the southwest, uh, soil's not very well developed, but those become the rangeland areas of uh, the southwest and western part of the United States.